Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last in our current series of Inspirational Women webinars. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Louise MacDonald and Brianna Pigado. Louise is incoming National Director of the Institute of Directors in Scotland and formerly CEO of the award-winning charity Young Scott. And Brianna is Creative Director of Fringe of Colour Films and is also currently Chair of YWCA Scotland, the Young Women's Movement, and that's an intergenerational movement that supports young women's leadership. Louise and Brianna, I know that you both have a fascinating story to tell. And I think to start with, we would all like to hear about your own personal journeys to get where you are now. Louise, let's start with you. You're, you're clearly someone who thrives on being challenged, being busy and being involved. Has this always been the case from an early age? Um, did you have a firm career path in mind when you were at school? Oh, that's a great question to start with. Um, I was counting the other day and I think I've had about 12 jobs. So the answer to that is definitely no. <laughs> there was no plan. Um, at, um, at school, um, I was um, very switched on by a brilliant modern studies teacher. It's quite a common story, I know, um, at lots of, in lots of places. Um, so I actually became a bit of an activist when I was at school. Mm -hmm. I um, got involved in my local anti-apartheid movement and, um, and got involved in all sorts of different mm -hmm. kind of causes. Um, and that really switched me on to thinking that I wanted to do work as a career that would make a difference in the world. I think that was that was the kind of the roots of that are in my um, in my modern studies classes um, with Mr. Smith. Um, so um, so yeah, so actually I began my career as a journalist, um, and um, I was very keen to um, to make a difference as a journalist, but. Um, probably quite quickly realised that um, I probably wasn't going to be winning any kind of Nobel Prizes for journalism um, and that it probably wasn't an environment um, that was a, a really a very good one. I was working in tabloid journalism and it wasn't a great place at the time. So I actually quit um, and actually started working at, um, at community level and, and got involved in community projects in my local area and involved in local charities and also setting up um, social enterprises and organisations at local level, which is where I began to specialise and work with young people and realised that I just loved it. I just really adored it um, and was then fortunate enough to join Young Scott um, and then became the chief exec 12 years ago. And eight days ago, <laughs> I took over um, a new role um, as the National um, Director for the Institute of Directors in Scotland. So, so yeah, a bit of a meandering path and very definitely no plan. Excellent. Now, Brianna, I know that you always, you also, um, you know, really want to make a difference. You, you didn't grow up in Scotland. Um, you came to Edinburgh University as an undergraduate. Um, I also recall when we spoke briefly the other day that you said the school you attended in the US was perhaps a little similar to St Margaret's. Um, can you tell us a bit about your school career, your ambitions at an earlier age and, and how you have progressed to, to where you are now? Sure. So I'm from the States. I'm from Washington, D.C. and came to Edinburgh in 2010. have been here ever since. Um, it's such a good question because I, I did go to a school say, similar to St. Margaret's. Um, I went to a school called Grace Episcopal Day School and then on to a school called Murray. Um, and in DC, Murray is known to be a private school, but uh, to be quite a creative one. Uh, we, we have kind of a reputation um, of that amongst the, the private schools. And I mentioned this because I started off my school career at Montessori School, actually. And I have to say this because Montessori, I don't know if you all know um, the philosophy, you may, Maria Montessori who set it up, um, but it was a school that very much instilled in you your own kind of independence and direction. Mm -hmm. I remember my shoelace coming undone when I was three and I went to my teacher and I had two teachers that were women, Ernestine and Claudine, and I went to Ernestine and I said, Ernestine, my, my shoelace is coming undone and she said, okay, Brianna, you know, you have a diagram, you need to sort it. <laughs> And so the, the kind of philosophy was always, you know, we're not, we're not, there were obviously rules, but 
we're not going to tell you what the answer is. You know, we'll support you, but you need to kind of discover that. And I think that's really led a lot of kind of my philosophy in life and maybe contributed a lot to my personality. Um, but yes, what led me to Edinburgh and led me to where I am now is I grew up in a family, I think, that spent a lot of time volunteering. My grandmother was an English teacher. My grandfather was a civil servant. My mother, which I'm really grateful for, accomplished a lot of firsts in her life. So she worked in the Clinton administration uh, under the Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown. So she was his assistant secretary, uh, which is a deputy, not, not an assistant secretarial assistant um, and I think you know, between being surrounded by family members that were very creative but did not go into careers in the arts I was always sort of told that's a hobby that's not something you should do professionally um, and I think when I got to Edinburgh I really I was studying international relations and then I went on to study sustainable development and it was the first degree of its kind at Edinburgh University. I was in a cohort of four of us and it's first ever year. Um, and that was looking at the climate crisis from a social, economic, political standpoint. So I've always been a person that's happy to try things. I'll you know, put my energy into something. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I don't think that my family has always been that excited about my approach to life. <laughs> I remember having to really convince my mother, my father was supportive of, of switching my degree to sustainable mm -hmm. development. But essentially, it was my time in Edinburgh um, that I got really involved in student politics, um, whether or not it was um, helping to set up the first Black History Month at the University of Edinburgh or um, doing a lot of work. Theresa May brought in some policies that had an impact on me and international students at the university, so I did a lot of work with them and became the first uh, president of Edinburgh University Students Association in 2014 um, and in that year set up a festival called the Edinburgh Student Arts Festival and long story short that kind of launched my career into the arts and creative industries but I think I probably thought I was going to be doing work in politics or um, international relations but the festival I set up similar to Louise was actually a social enterprise so I was really launched into the social enterprise community in Scotland and the year I set up the festival as a social enterprise I think the number of registered social enterprises in Scotland went up by 92 percent 60 percent of social enterprise leaders were women so it was a very supportive space and environment to work in. Great gosh now that really whets our appetite to to find out more about both of you. Um, Louise, I'll come to you first of all about, um, obviously you've just been in your current role for eight days as, as, as you say, but previous to that, um, a, a lengthy and very successful career at Young Scott. And I think in that career, you, you were able to demonstrate how, how passionate you feel about improving the, the, the lives of, of young people as they grow up. Um, what is it about young people that you most wanted to raise awareness of? Oh, that's easy. That they're just amazing, <laughs> basically. Um, I think a lot of it was just um, what I experienced was I when I um, I, I set up a volunteer centre um, from scratch. That was one of the things that I did when I quit journalism, the role that I moved into, and um, and that was setting up all kinds of programmes around encouraging people to be involved as volunteers in their community and. But what I was seeing was the number of young people that were turning up at the volunteer centre saying, what can I do? What can I get involved in? Or if I was nipping out from a sandwich at lunchtime and there was a group of young people, you know, at the, at the end of the street, you know, and whatever, and I'd get kind of chatting or whatever, they'd be like, oh, you know, we really want to fix this and it would be better if you could do X and Y. And they were never short of ideas about how to make things better. And yet... What I was hearing from adults was young people don't care, they're really apathetic, you know, they don't want to get involved, they're selfish. And, I, and it just didn't compute because it wasn't my experience. And, and so started to spend more time with young people around kind of volunteering. And, and to this day, um, in all the work that I have done, um, without exception, you know, the young people um, you know, that I've met and, the young, and young people generally, want to make things better and it's not just about making things better for themselves actually they genuinely put themselves at the end of the queue what they want is to make things better for other people 
you know, they want to make things better for their families, for those that they love and care about, and for their communities. And in particular, those young people who've perhaps been through experiences um, that have been really tough and painful, um, yeah. they want to make sure that no other young person has to go through what they went through. Um, and the other thing that I find remarkable about young people is, um, is their sense of fairness. And, and I love that. I love that sense of um, quite often um, when we were working at Young Scott, we'd be working with policymakers and those that were involved in strategy. And we would bring them together with young people to have conversations about these issues and how to make it better. And just how quickly young people would get to the heart of the issue and about how fairness was the thing that, that really mattered. Um, and, and so all of that, just throughout all of the kind of the work that I've done um, with young people, um, never once has any kind of young person kind of, you know, let me down in terms of that kind of operating yeah. theory or experience. Their, their kind of commitment to fairness, their desire to help other people, what they don't have is a place at the table. You know, they don't get in the room. Um, they're not kind of included as experts of their own experience. They're not kind of brought in and recognised. Um, and so a huge part of the work that I have done um, over, over recent years has been around how to create more space um, to, uh, to get you know, young people um, in the room, particularly with policy and decision makers and those making decisions in communities at national and local level. Um, to actually say that they are equal partners in decision making because of their own expertise around their, their kind of own experience. So it's just um, it's just a joy to work with um, with young people and to um, and to kind of experience that um, that sense of um, um, kind of passion and demand for kind of what's right um, from young yeah. people and they're, and they're not really willing to accept you know some of the some of the convoluted arguments that adults will come up with to, to yeah. explain why things have I been and how they need to continue the way they are. Um, I just um, I just think that's an incredible moment when you see that coming from young people and in particular mm -hmm. when that energy meets sources of power. I think something really magic happens there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, throughout your career, Louise, you, you, you seem to have dedicated yourself to, to helping to shape Scotland's future. Um, and I, I gather that some current board positions that, that you hold include the First Minister's Advisory Council on Women and Girls and also the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Post-COVID-19 Futures Commission. Now, that, those sound really interesting roles. What exactly do they entail? Oh, I think the technology's perhaps frozen there. Um, we might come to. We might come <laughs> good to. Good question. And so good the, question. I am co-chair yeah. of the First Minister's um, narrow. Or you? Yeah. Yeah. Can you still hear me, Louise? I can hear you. Sorry, I think I froze. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Can, can you tell us a little bit about the, the roles on those um, two advisory groups that, that I've just mentioned? I can. So the First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls, I am the co-chair alongside a brilliant woman um, called Professor Ema Jackson. Um, from Glasgow Caledonian University mm -hmm. um, and the work of that is to advise the First Minister on how we make gender inequality in Scotland a historical curiosity. So by that we mean something that in you know hopefully the not too distant future we look at some of the inequalities that affect women um, and that's all women um, and from a, 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 I'm really taking that a kind of a, a, an approach that's supportive of all women and say, how could we let that be in Scotland? How was that allowed to be the case um, in Scotland? So we've been developing a whole range of recommendations for the First Minister over the past three years. Mm -hmm. The thing that I would say is what we have done in that work is that what we have tried to do is lots of the conversations around gender inequality are around the day-to-day -day kind of experiences, which are the outcomes of gender inequality. Um, so the things that kind of happen to um, to people on a on a daily basis, in particular, happen to women and girls. But what we've tried to say is, how can we look back and find out what is the root cause of those? What is it in the system, the way that we operate, 
that results in those things happening. Because actually we spend so much energy trying to kind of fix the outcome of these things, which are just so often so poor and so awful. Mm -hmm. But actually, we need to try and get to the root cause. So the idea is that we've been spending time looking at that with the hope that then the recommendations that we put forward help to tackle those root causes, which should see a reduction in some of those in those those kind of um, impacts. So that work um, is, is has been incredible work. We've worked across Scotland and um, worked with communities and. Um, an intersectional approach to that so try to kind of um, make sure that our, our approach is, has been inclusive and recognize that the kind of the experiences particularly of um, women and girls who suffer um, more in terms of the, the kind of the impacts of, of those systems in terms of the marginalization that they experience so it's been incredible to, to do we've now um, Put our recommendations to the first minister she said yes to the set of first two and uh, we're just waiting to hear back in terms of her response to the third set of recommendations so the idea is next is working with the first minister and the scottish government on the implementation of those recommendations as well and the post-covid commission again really fascinating piece of work First of all, I think for all of us, we have to kind of recognise the tragedy that this past 15 months, 16 months it has been. And for anyone who's who's kind of in, on this call and been part of this event, you know, if that's um, been something that's affected you personally um, around that, then, you know, then you have my heart and I hope you're doing OK and I hope your families are doing OK. Um, but it's also about then saying, OK, if we're what, what next then for Scotland um, in terms of that and how do we how do we recover how do we support people and um, how do we kind of make sure that people are able to kind of feel supported as we think about what comes next and and you know and think about well what lessons have we learned have we listened yeah. to the public well enough in terms of those, those experiences as well so so we're in the in the final stages of, of that in um, commission and uh, hopefully by the end of the summer there will be a um, some um, report and outcomes uh, of that work as well which people will be able to see super thank you um brianna in in recent years you have been named as one of scotland's 30 under 30 inspiring women how do you inspire people and also what inspires and drives you? What a question. What a question. <laughs> um, I think a good answer to that would be that a lot of the work that I do focuses on um, improving things for the people that I'm working with. So for example, if we look at the Edinburgh Student Arts Festival that I set up in 2014, yes, that started out as a mini fringe festival for students. And then after running that festival for a year and speaking to people across four universities in Edinburgh, Edinburgh College, really actually starting to look at the barriers that people face to the arts and creative industries, whether or not it's because they're living more rurally or can't afford to work in the arts, can't afford to move to Edinburgh over the summer to kind of try their luck at the fringe festivals. Um, we started to kind of, and I started to design a festival that addressed the barriers that young people were faced into the arts and, and emerging artists and, and creatives. Um, my first job out of university after my years as USA president, um, which was, which was fascinating. I, I think I, I'll take a quick pause to say that if you're interested in politics, you know, get involved with your student union. You know, student unions across the UK are multi-million pound organizations. Uh, they have staff, they run venues. Not only are they uh, supporting students and representing student voices to universities, but they are incredible training grounds for leadership, for politics, for understanding how to work with local councillors, MPs, MSPs, negotiating issues. It was a job that I loved. Um, the way that I was treated in that role, especially as a young black woman, was not acceptable. I really thought that um, the way that my um, work was being represented and the way that the nasty side of politics came through in that was, a really great learning experience. And I raised this issue 
everyone watching today because I think we're all living in a world of social media and of a lot of polarization. And I'm not saying that that should ever stop you from doing anything you want to do. But I think that it's really important when you think about the type of work you want to do and the type of leadership role you might want to have is to kind of think about who's important to you and kind of where you find your center and your center of power. <laughs> Um, and where you get support, because that's going to take you a long way. Um, but yeah, to answer that question, the work that I've done throughout my career has definitely been about how do barriers become doorways? And actually, what do we need to do nationally to enable more people to access something that I think inherently is something everyone has? Everyone is creative. We're human beings. Whether or not we're getting up in the morning and making our breakfast, uh, going on to do the work that we're doing, supporting our family, speaking to our friends. We, we build things as humans, we have throughout society. So I think it's really important that people um, across the country know that they have an access and opportunity to be creative and really know the impact of the creative industries of the manufacturing industry in the UK and um, build everything from our houses and laptops and, and tablets to ideas that are gonna shape our future about how we're gonna learn. Sure. Sure. Uh, Brianna, I know that um, you, you, know, you are a great advocate of standing up and, and fighting for what you believe in. I mean, what are the, the issues that are really important to you? I think there are a number. I think the, I'll say three. I think the top is, you know, I think being a young person myself and being a person in the world, uh, I can't uh, be... I, I can't move through the world without thinking about the climate crisis. I mean, mm -hmm. it's something coming, it's impending, it's something we're going to have to work together to address um, the impacts of the climate crisis as we know people in our country very differently, people that live on the, on, in the highlands and islands, that live on the coast. We think about um, not just temperature you know, change, but um, our, what's happening to our oceans. We had World Oceans Day earlier this week, so that's something that's really close to my heart. Um, and thinking about how that has an uneven impact, negative impact on people all over the world because of you know, our privilege, our wealth, our access to resources and materials in this part of the world. And then the second thing I'll just say is I, I power. You know, I, I work as chair of the board of the Young Women's Movement because I know that the power that young women, non-binary folk, gender queer folk have in the world that have been marginalized and I think that it's young women's voices and voices of different genders that are going to bring the knowledge, power, ideas we need to have a more fair, equitable, creative, happy, mentally well world. So um, everything that's wrapped up in that, whether or not it's positive mental health, equality and fairness, uh, is just really important to me. Yeah, great answer, thank you. Now I see that we do have several questions um, coming in. Um, Maybe touching on, on something that, that you've um, hinted at there about, you know, building resilience. Um, Louise, I'll, I'll come to you first. What advice would you give to our young woman um, of today in terms of building resilience and, and actually growing from the experiences that they gain along the way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a, it's a great question because I think a lot about the word resilience and I think a lot about how we ask young people to be um, resilient. And I always want to kind of split that in, in two. Um, I think resilience is hugely important and I'll come on to that. But the other thing that I think is important is that we have to be really thoughtful about continuing to ask young people and in particular young women to be resilient in the face of systems that actually seek to, to harm them, okay? It's not acceptable to keep asking girls and young women to become more resilient in the face of sexual harassment. It's appalling that we have to do that. So there's, there's a piece for me in saying, when people are talking about resilience, ask why. Ask what it is that you're being asked to be resilient in the face of, and then say, is that acceptable, yeah? Because it's things like we, you know, we do lots and lots about staying safe online and lots and lots of training about staying safe online. 
where's the big conversation about the, the necessity of companies and others to make sure that those things don't happen? We're putting all the weight on young mm -hmm. women and girls um, to be resilient in the face of a system that actually seeks to harm them. I just, so, so I, I, that question just runs around in my head a huge amount, actually, um, when, I, when I talk about in, in resilience. Having said that, personal resilience to keep going, to, to kind of, you know, um, fit, get, you know, take a breath even when, when you're in the middle of something, whatever that something is, where it's feeling a bit like, whoa, this feels a bit hard or, okay, I didn't expect to find myself here or I'm not quite sure how to, to, um, to, to deal with these circumstances. That moment of taking a breath, as, as Brianna has said, centering yourself, you know, connecting with your own power in terms of, of who you are and what you believe in and what it is that you want to achieve in the world. Um, and having those moments, you know, to, to actually stop and um, think, but also then that resilience, it shouldn't just be about you trying to carry everything yourself. Resilience is also about, you know, being yeah. able to have good people around you, good friends, you know, people in your kind of community, you know, whether that's family, carers, and um, whoever that might be, um, to actually be able to, to kind of um, say to them, I need, I need a bit of, you know, a bit of extra support here. I'm trying to figure this one out. Who can help me? Um, so building your kind of resilience web, almost your own kind of support yeah. web, um, is is important too, um, um, for anyone actually. I don't think that's just for for kind of young people, but young women. Um, but I think for for me, there is always a moment to just kind of just just question that word and how it's being applied and why why you're being asked to be um, resilient. And there are sometimes when it's a it's a, it's a good thing in the sense of, right, okay, you've got to keep going. And, you know, believe me, I know I've been knocked down a hundred times and going, right, okay, how do we get back up again from this one? For me, the most important thing in my own personal resilience has been staying true to what I believe in. And that's about making work, doing work that makes a difference, you know, that I, I, that I want to see um, change in the world. Um, and so therefore it's about saying, okay, I'm going to keep going, you know, I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to learn from what's happened and I'm going to keep going, but it's not going to affect my personal resolve because I know what I believe in and I know what's important to me. Um, so those are the, those are the bits for my personal resilience. Um, but I do, I do um, worry and probably get quite cross um, when we ask um, young people and in particular women and girls, um, and young young girls as well to um, oh you, you just need to learn more skills and how to deal with it or you know you have to figure out your way to get home safely or you have to figure out your way to do digital safely or you know um, actually because of um, misogyny and um, issues in the workplace and um, you're probably going to have to work twice as hard as hard and you're probably going to have to you know you'll need a mentor you don't need a mentor you're actually good enough it's the system that makes it difficult for you to proceed it's not a lack in you it's the system you know so i think some of those kind of questions i think are really important ones um, yeah. for young women and girls to think about yeah, yeah great advice there louise um brianna what's a, a typical day like in your job and what makes it worthwhile to get out of your bed in the mornings well i think for me and i'm going to be a little little cheeky and, and in bed some of the former question into it because I think it's important is um, my typical day. So I have been running organizations and running teams throughout my career. I've been in a very lucky place where I've worked very hard, had the right opportunities, had the right access, had the right support and ended up um, being trusted with a lot of people's jobs and a lot of people's ideas and passions. Um, so for me at the moment, I'm the co-director of one organization and I run a film festival uh, my typical day might be having a team meeting, not in the morning. We have a team that works internationally, so it's normally in the evening. Um, I'm making decisions about things like everything from what films are going to be showing in our festival program to marketing decisions, what's going out on social media. How are we making our festival accessible? So we are having um, audio descriptions, captioning, British sign language embedded into every aspect of our festival. So back to some of what Louise was saying uh, earlier about her work in the National Council, and she mentioned intersectionality. 
I work in the arts, but I work in a space where I work with a lot of marginalized people, whether or not they're black, whether or not they're people of color, whether or not they're LGBT plus and queer. So I'm constantly thinking about how do we create safe space for the people we're working in and working with to thrive. Um, I've been in a lot of institutions, arts organizations, and national bodies throughout my career, and my experiences there completely shape how I work now and actually are the direct opposite of those experiences. And I think what can be so wonderful is I'm around a lot of creative people. So they remind me that um, things are not going to go smoothly. We we're going to run into a lot of problems. We talk about this in the startup world of fail fast, right? And I don't know if I love that phrase, but there is something important about failure. Failure is going to happen in life. And the thing is that artists and creative people uh, expect that. They find it fun. It's part of their process you know something goes wonky it goes wrong it turns into something else and I think it's been a really humbling and really wonderful thing to be around people that approach life with that viewpoint and perspective rather than thinking about something as it being wrong it's actually about the gray area and what comes out of these beautiful changes um, but yeah that, that that can be my work I actually spend a lot of time thinking about and working on policy as well so the practical day-to-day -day things of supporting artists and making films and making work versus what are the impacts uh, on the arts community and the creative industries with COVID and all sorts. So I'm constantly tottering between managing a festival and managing an organization, thinking about people's mental health, but also how do we change things to make them more supportive for people working in the industry? Yeah, great. Um... I mean, you're both hugely successful in, in, in your own right. Um, have you faced any challenges in terms of being young, successful woman? Um, you know, perhaps managing people who are a, a lot older than you are or, or a lot more experienced. Um, Louise, has that been a challenge for you? Oh, well, bless you for saying I'm still young. It's been a long time. <laughs> Um, so, um, so, um, so I'm very definitely not. Um, and um, although perhaps a good advert for working with young people, um, I, when I was younger, um, I, I think I am, I am of an age. So, for some of your um, young women and girls watching this, this, this maybe won't be familiar. But if there are others um, watching it um, who are who are a wee bit older they might um, recognize this but when when I was starting out um, and for quite a long time in my career if you had been asked me if I'd been affected by um, any kind of issues around um, gender inequality in particular I'd have gone no 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 not at all about 10 years ago I had a bit of an epiphany where I looked back and began to see it I began to realize what actually had been happening. But because I was inside a system, whereas it's expected that that was the way that things happened, I didn't even know it was wrong. I didn't know that what was happening was anything I could even have challenged. And I suppose what I'm really um, thankful about now is there is a much greater awareness that actually these things aren't acceptable. That, yeah. that you can challenge, that you can speak out, um, and that actually these things are, are not acceptable. And that was a real moment for me 10 years ago, because I was, I was, you know, I was very much, I was one of these, women, oh, I'm not for all women shortlists and all of these kind of things. I was, I was one of those people. Um, I'm not now, <laughs> because I've now had that wake up call and I've now realized what, what I've seen. It's a bit like the story, isn't it, about if, a, if you've got a goldfish in a bowl, and you put a kind of a clear bit of glass down the middle of the bowl and the goldfish swims in this bit of the bowl. You take the glass away, they don't move to the other side because they don't even know it's there. They're only used to this bit, you know, and it's that sort of sense of, of having that opened up. So now I do see in terms of in particular in, in, in tabloid journalism and um, as a young um, woman who was, you know, I was 20, I was clearly ambitious, I was lucky I'd started in national and um, I started working in a national tabloid newspaper um, at that point. Um, I now look at some of the behaviours and some of the things that happened there and I'm, I'm actually horrified. I'm horrified. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really, I think there's something quite interesting um, for um, 
older women now who are kind of reflecting back, but also the kind of conversations that we're now, you know, able to have with young women now, and I include, you know, Brianna and that, and um, and others younger than, than Brianna too, um, about actually what that what that world looks like um, now. And I think there's there's potentially more conversations needed about understanding um, the experiences that some people have, have kind of go, gone through. Um, um, through their, you know, when, from when they were in their kind of younger days as well. So it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's an, it's an interesting conversation, I think, around yeah. around that, and one worth having intergenerationally as well. Yeah, Bri Brianna, same question to you. I mean, what are the challenges that you faced along the way? I have definitely experienced a lot of ageism. You know, this expectation okay. that because I'm young, I don't know what I'm talking about, and. I, I'll say two things about it, and I think there's a way to kind of manage it. You know, I, I, I say this with all humility implied. When you're good at what you do, you work hard, it threatens people. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you are well-spoken, when you know what you're talking about, and, and so I mentioned I studied sustainable development, but I'm really interested in governance, and that goes to boards, that goes to management. I love um, being in in spaces, setting up new organizations and companies. I like building things. That, that's my skill set, you know, is taking those risks and starting out at the beginning of something and seeing it bloom. Um, and I, I spent some time working in, uh, or being trained, I really should say, in Scotland's oldest social enterprise incubator, the Melting Pot. I was in their program for six months, uh, run by a wonderful woman called Claire Carpenter. And I really understand third sector governance and social enterprises. And um, I've been in positions in my life throughout my career where I have had to blow the whistle. I've had to whistle blow on things going on that are not right. And I think it's particularly challenging when it's a young woman saying, uh, hold on a minute, that's not ethical, or hold on a minute, that's not how we're meant to do these things, that uh, people really get their backs up. And I don't go into situations intending to do this. It just, it happens because I notice these things. Um, and what I'll say is in my first job out of universities, this is when I was student union president, I sat in a boardroom um, and, you know, here I am 21 years old, uh, chair of the board of a, 20, of a 10 million pound charity. You know, no one prepares you for that. And I was sitting with the chief executive and um, I swear that I said something and five minutes later, he repeated the very same sentence. And when I said it, no one reacted. And when he said it, everyone was laughing. And again, it's those instances of sexism that I, that's what Louise said. When I was younger, I would have said no, never experienced it, or that's a thing of the past. And I was just really um, not aware of my own experiences of sexism and um, inequality. In that, in, a, in that gender lens, in that gendered way. And my mouth just hung open and it was my first time with my eyes really opening up to, wow, not only is this systemic and structural, but the tiny micro things that happen that start to eat at you are really challenging. And all I have to say is, is if people react to you or don't know how to react to you because you're good at what you do, and I think coming out of a school like St. Margaret's as well, where you have so much, um, support and privilege and access and I'm very aware of my own you know you think about how well trained you are and how well equipped you are for the world and you have opportunities that a lot of other people don't and the way that you come across might threaten people or it may not they might welcome it but I think all I all I can say about kind of managing those situations as a recovering overachiever and a recovering perfectionist <laughs> um, is genuinely to just take a pause and take a step back and and keep being yourself keep working hard and if people react there it's not about you and it is about a wider system that you can contribute to changing uh don't pull the ladder up after you and i'm sure you wouldn't do that support other people around mm -hmm. you in the community it's about collaboration over competition but when it happens uh, take it if you can as a compliment and know that it's not about you i'm not yeah. saying that it's acceptable but it, it is something that I've, I've kind of had to just giggle at because i sit back and go this doesn't have anything to do with me thanks brianna i mean it, it's just fascinating to, to to listen to both of you and and I mean, if you're looking back on, you know, your careers to date, your achievements to date, um, 
Louise, coming to you first of all, what advice would you give to your 17 or 18 year old self, i.e. The, the age that our sixth year girls are just now about to step out into the world? Knowing what you do now, um, you know, would you do things any differently or? I don't think I'd do anything differently because, um, cause, yeah, so, you know, lots of it have been happy accidents, but they've led me where, where I am. You know, there's been a lot of blooming hard work in there too, but, um, but you know, but lots of it has been through saying yes to things a lot of times and just kind of, you know, and being brave actually and saying, okay, I'll give it, I'll give it a shot. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't think I would change anything. I think, um, I think I would probably, um, I would probably say, I'm, I'm struggling to kind of think how to say this in a way that actually kind of would mean something to other people, but sometimes I just felt like I didn't pay enough attention or ask enough questions of what was going on around me. I was a bit too accepting of things and, <laughs> and didn't ask, which as an ex-journalist is a hugely embarrassing admission. Um, I would do it in my, <laughs> in my job. But I mean, in terms of how the world worked and, and why things happened the way they happened, I was probably too accepting of things mm -hmm. and just kind of went, oh, well, that's how it is. No, you know, the world is made the way it is by humans. So therefore, we can make it differently. Yeah. And so there's, 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 there's recognizing that you can change things. And I probably came to that, I had an ambition for it, but I probably didn't realize my own power to do it until probably a bit too late um, um, or later than, than, than perhaps should have been the case. Um, so, so for me, it's that questioning how things are done and why things are the way we are, they are, and never just accepting, oh, well, that's how, how things have been. And, um, but and I also think I was absolutely one of those um, one of those girls who just absolutely hated herself growing up. I was, you know, hated the way I looked, hated everything about myself, spent far too long just being angry at, at me and, um, and why I wasn't perfect and why I wasn't one of these girls that was amazing at hockey and all of that malarkey because I wasn't, um, you know, and all of these kind of things. And, um, and oh, my goodness, just so much energy wasted. On, yep. on disliking myself just oh man <laughs> um and so I'd probably change that a lot um because um because actually you know who you are and everything you're about to become in that stage of life that you are at um you are absolutely beautiful you you're it's not possible for you to be anything other than that um, and so I just, you know, I, I, that's one of the kind of things that I would want to, to kind of say to girls is to just have that, just just recognise how just basically inside, you know, how fabulous you are um, and don't apologise for taking up space. Just don't apologise. Just just get out there and um, turn up as well, because the world is run by those who turn up. So turn up. <laughs> Would be nice. I think that's great advice for, for, for our girls who are listening. Brianna, what would you say to your younger self now, looking back? I also wouldn't change anything, but what I would say to my younger self is to take more breaks and to slow down. Mm -hmm. I, especially leaving school at a school that encouraged me to take, take every opportunity, say yes all the time. I look back on my career and see how burnt out I was, how overrun I was, because I was constantly trying to do everything. And I didn't think that I was gonna run out of time. I mean, I hopefully won't <laughs> yet, but you know, you can do it all. You just can't do it all at the same time. And I think our society encourages us to go at such a fast pace to achieve, to hustle, to keep going. And we have one body we have to protect our mental health. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think that being motivated is wonderful, working hard is wonderful, but actually knowing that sometimes saying no doesn't mean things will pass you by. Yeah. If they do, yeah. they'll come around. Um, and I just think that sometimes, you know, taking that, taking things and slowing down a bit, resting, um, yeah. and I from the perspective of just don't overdo it because this is coming from a person that has always overdone it um and it hasn't served me well yes i've achieved a lot of things <laughs> and i wouldn't you know ever take them back but i think i i would have really benefit from not trying to prove myself so much and i don't think i was trying to prove anyone but myself but i was definitely a person that 
if someone told me I couldn't do something, those are my favorite words. It was like, oh, you watch me do it now. If you think I can't do it, you just watch me do it. And I think it's good to have that energy. It's really important to have that energy, but know that you can share the load, you can ask for help. If you're a person that's motivated, that's a volunteer that gives, that's wonderful, but know that of course you can't give mm -hmm. from an empty cup and just really make sure to look after yourself. I think that's really sound advice. Look after yourself and, and sometimes know to take those breaks and, and know that, you know, everything doesn't have to be perfect and you can still get there in the end. Um, you know, progress is progress, however slow, um, you know, it takes. Now, I'm, as I say, just just so fascinated to hear, hear your journeys. Um, they're, they're, they're very exotic journeys to me. Um, how do you see your future roadmap ahead of you, Louise? Oh wow, Serge. Yeah. So, um, so I, um, I've been quite thoughtful about this actually, bizarrely, um, because I, I do think a lot about um, what difference I can make in the world. That is just it's something that really drives me. It's something that drives me hugely, um, and. Uh, I actually had quite major surgery a couple of years ago, really um, significant um, surgery. And I suppose as, as ever, these life-changing moments um, make you stop and think very similar to what Brianna is saying, because I am, yes, I am. I'm not quite sure I'm in recovery from overachievement yet, Brianna, but I should probably have an ambition to, re to recover. Um, but what I was very thoughtful about um, was okay, how much of my working life, how much active life do I probably kind of have? You know, let's let's kind of figure that out. Um, and in which case, within that time frame, what is it that I want to do, recognising that actually my energy is not infinite? <laughs> so I had always been like, I'll just keep going. I'll do everything. Um, so there's a, there's a piece there for kind of saying, actually, I'm going to value my own energy i'm going to um think about it as a precious commodity okay so my abilities my um the kind of the skills that i have the influence and also now because of the work that i do i recognize the influence and privilege that i have i recognize the power that mm -hmm. i now have and for a working class girl who never went to uni and all the rest of it it's quite a strange thing for me to kind of be where i am now i find I find myself kind of kind of putting a bit of a question mark over my head quite a lot. But I've decided to say if I take that and, and view it as something that's that's um that, that has value, where do I want to place it? What are the things that matter to me? And what matters is where I can make a difference in the world. Um and my move to the Institute of Directors is part of that because I think there's a, a huge contribution in terms of the change that um businesses who are committed to great governance to and um, to be in really great ethical organizations and um, i think can make a huge difference in, in the world and particularly around more collaboration and working across sectors and um, and so i'm really fascinated to and um, to see what work i can do with that community and um, to help that community to make a contribution and um, to and um, to scotland and um, and and more broadly um, but also then I do the, 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 the kind of the volunteer work and the non-executive work that I do. So I'm uh, obviously on the First Minister's Advisory Council um, on women and girls, but also um, I'm part of an organisation called Five Rights with Baron S. B. Ban Kidron, um, which focuses on digital rights and young people, because that's an area that I'm really passionate about, um, and in particular how we take a rights-based approach. So in some ways it's about saying, okay, these are, these are my passions, um, that, um, but actually my, my kind of energy is a kind of bit of a kind of precious commodity and I need to kind of think about it that way and think about where I, I want to put that. Ultimately, I'm heading for um, a kind of a slightly early retirement, I hope, a little bit, um, where I can focus on nature photography because that's my huge passion. And I have a dream of doing a kind of photography project where I go to the source of a river and then follow it from its source to the sea, taking photographs along the way as I walk right. along it. And I want to walk it. I want to walk the, the whole river. 
I want to just photograph it. So that's that's my ultimate aim. I'd probably have a dog with me as well and all the rest of it. So, you know, I've got it all in my head. Um, but that's the kind of ultimate kind of direction. I already do lots Fantastic. of photography. I'm yeah. not waiting to do that, by the way. I do lots of photography now. But ultimately, when when work is gone, that's where I'll, that's where you'll find me, by a river with a camera. <laughs> Fantastic. Brianna, what about your future um, route map? Where do you think it's going to take you? I love the nature of photography, Louise. I think that's yeah. brilliant. So three big things um, I'm thinking about at the moment. The first is I've stayed in Scotland doing this work uh, for a really big reason. You might think that, you know, she studied sustainable development, what she's doing in the creative sector. Like, how, is, how does that even work? And um, you know, looking at the climate crisis, looking at the, the world we're moving towards. I've been in the arts and creative industries because I believe it's going to take creative thinking to solve our problems. And being around the people that spend so much time in that creative space has been um, really nurturing for me. It's been really important. I see the creative industries as sustainable development 2.0. We're going to need designers, systems thinkers, strategic thinkers, product designers to kind of make that happen. But what's been interesting is watching how over the last 10 years in Scotland and, and particularly in the last couple, the combination of the creative industries, the data and the tech world growing as much as it is. Uh, the data driven innovations taking place, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, so many things going on with that. And then the third sector and what Louise has spoken about a lot, social enterprise, purpose driven businesses, the ethical sector, how those three things are coming together, are coming together in a way that is not happening anywhere else in the world. So I think that's a really beautiful thing about Scotland. I see it as a second Scottish enlightenment. I always say that. So what I think is going to happen next is Believe it or not, even though I'm 28 and I turn 29 next month, I've been on about uh, 12 boards in my life. <laughs> and I think uh, by the time I turn 30, I won't be doing that anymore. <laughs> uh, I'm doing the opposite of what most people do. And I think I actually want to take some more time to focus on this one thing you might find a bit funny. I'm really interested in trauma. I'm interested in how trauma impacts the decisions we make about our relationship to the planet and each other, the way trauma works within companies and organizations impacts the way people treat each other, our intergenerational trauma from wars, from conflicts impacts our decisions now and trauma is actually at the core of a lot of why things either go wrong or why we treat each other in certain ways. So. I'm going to be moving into that space. I've already done um, some training, kind of trauma-informed training and care, some healing work, and that kind of informs everything I do anyway. Um, but I see myself in the next five to 10 years kind of moving more into that space. I'm not saying I won't still be in the creative industries or in startups and social enterprise, but I'd like to focus on how do we heal that? How do we heal that collectively? You know, looking at the pandemic for a moment of collective yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, how do we transform that to lead better, to live in healthier societies, healthier worlds? And that's still sustainable development. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, I think we're, we're coming to the end of our questions. So um, my goodness, what can I say to both of you? Just a huge, huge thank you for for giving of your time um, to be with us this evening. I, I know that I have just found both of you such engaging guests, and I know that our audience will have done as, as well. You, you are indeed truly, truly inspiring role models, um, you know, for all our young women here at, at St. Margaret. So, so thank you again. Um, I must also thank um, Aberdeen Standard Capital, um, our sponsors um, who've helped make this series of inspirational women webinars possible. And finally, thank you to our, our audience for being with us tonight. Um, I'm sure you'll agree that it's just been a fantastic past hour that, that we've all shared. So um, all that remains is for me to wish everyone a, a very good evening and bye-bye uh, from St. Margaret's. Bye-bye. <laughs>